So what do a scientist do at this point? I mean, you in your papers you have shown high salinity it can tolerate and uh, so you have shown, so then what is the next step? So can you take it to farmers? Yes, taking to farmers is still a uh, long way. But uh, what we have done, this mm -hmm. whole uh, model initially was developed in tobacco. Mm -hmm. So this was transferred into a crop plant like mm -hmm. uh, rice. rice uh, the rice also we are able to show that it can be grown under high salinity. This was also tested by uh, Salinity Research Institute in Karnal where the experiments were done. And also under drought conditions, mm -hmm. low water content. So rice can tolerate if you have made uh, uh, you know, transgenic plants mm -hmm. with these uh, genes. Of course, there are many other genes which we are trying along with this, which is called uh, gene pyramiding, which has been mm -hmm. done. Because only these two genes may not give, we may need uh, many other genes. So there is some work which has been done where other genes mm -hmm. have also been put into it. So we have currently a rice plant which these two genes mm -hmm. along with some other genes and these are marker free because okay. we developed a technology where we don't need antibiotic selection marker selections. Marker. Mm -hmm. So we have our own marker selection system. So these are marker free rice plants which can tolerate high uh, salinity and drought, drought. conditions. Mm -hmm. And these uh, plants have were transferred earlier to a company to test it in the field conditions. But uh, to do those experiments in limited field trials, in greenhouse it's working, in the, even in their place it's working. But to do limited field trials we need uh, regulatory bodies, uh, you know, permissions, approve. which are not yet coming up. But hopefully, if this Brassica story goes through, which was published in the paper a few days back, mm -hmm. that there are probably are CGM clearances there. Dr. Then, Painters. Dr. Painters thing. Then probably, if those permissions come, mm -hmm. we can test it. It has a potential, uh -huh. but potential needs to be tested, tested in the field right. conditions. That's where we are. So even in it. field condition, there are much stronger restrictions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't do that, you know, okay. without permissions and uh, specific containment uh, things we have done. But what is interesting is that uh, this whole uh, Glaxley story mm -hmm. has not been taken up by many other groups. Right. It was restricted to our laboratory for many, many years. Mm -hmm. But now there are many groups in Japan, in China. Uh, I reviewed uh, recently some papers. Uh, they are doing it in rice. They oh. are doing it in many other crop plants. And uh, we also give on our clones to... Uh, workers in Chile mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Russia mm -hmm. and they have published in tomato. Oh, okay. They are also publishing it in citrus where these clones are working. So there is a uh, potential of translation work uh, from what has been done here. Hopefully someday uh, the product will see the light of the day. Light you know. of the day yeah. right. So continuing this conversation in general if, because you are from plant uh, field if you zoom out uh, with current biotechnology available to us, how successful, even though we don't get to take our genetically modified plants to the farmer or field, but in general, how successful are we in answering the question of, let's say, increasing the yield or, you know, uh, uh, countering abiotic or uh, biotic stresses for plants? So, are we at a decent place that we have achieved a success? To like. Uh this in rice, mm -hmm. not in India. India, of course, the germplasm was taken from here. Mm -hmm. In Erie, uh, they developed uh, submergence tolerance. Mm -hmm. So there is a variety which is submergence tolerance, which has been developed by a different technology. What people are trying to look at, uh, maybe in nature there is already something existing. So this is what we call the phenopics. So you test all the existing accessions which exist in nature and test them for different parameters. Mm -hmm those of which which can tolerate, which cannot tolerate. And even in nature, if you find something, then you do the normal breeding methods. Right. Or people are also going into marker assistance breeding. If you have specific markers, then use those and mm -hmm. develop this. So phenomics technologies, marker assisted breeding technologies uh, are something which are other than transgenic approach mm -hmm. in order to develop uh, plants uh -huh. which can be tolerant, tolerant. to these stresses as well as uh, people are taking mutation breeding. Right. There is no ban on mutation breeding. You can mutate seeds and grow and see whether you develop variations. Right, right. Although mutation breeding uh, creates more disturbance in the genome than genetic engineering, but that is not uh, barred from testing. 
So there are many other alternate uh, strategies which people are using. But everybody is hopeful that uh, this technology will also be adopted somewhere. It's not a replacement technology. Mm -hmm. But it will be one more additional tool to which uh, agriculturists can use along with agronomy, along with other things in order to develop uh, yeah. plants with higher yield and also what we Resistant. call it uh, climate resilient agriculture. So in changing climate conditions, yeah. the plants will be able to tolerate. And uh, these are very, very complicated trades. In fact, one of the uh, person from industry came to us. He was a friend of ours. Mm -hmm. He said, you are developing these stress-tolerant plants, you know, drought-tolerant. Uh, but they want plant uh, which can tolerate drought, which can also tolerate more water, and which can also tolerate heat. Because these are the changing environmental conditions in reality. Global warming. Uh, so he said, uh, if you have only one yes, drought, sir. if there is too much of rain, I lose my crop. Or if the temperature rises by 2 degrees centigrade, uh, I don't get any grain development. Yes. So these are something which uh, is ongoing research. I think people will have to continuously work on this. So when there is this need and desire from both farmers and society, so what is this care about GMOs then in our country particularly? I mean, scare, I'm bound to ask you this. Scare is there. Uh, uh -huh. Scare is sometimes the scare is real. Sometimes scare is created. Mm -hmm. You know, they used to tell us a story that if you are scared of snakes, even if there is something lying in the corner, you know, rope or something, you will feel that that is also a snake. snake you know, right. darkness may and that also looks mm -hmm. like a snake. I think we have to weigh mm -hmm. the benefits and risks. If uh, you have already tested, I, I'm not saying that there should not mm -hmm. be regulation, there should be testing. But if you have proved scientifically with uh, all the methodologies that the food which you're uh, producing is safe, mm -hmm. both for human consumption, for animal consumption, or for environmental safety, then there should not be any opposition to this. But sometimes the opposition is for different reasons. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get into this. Because they will say, what will happen after 50 years? No, nobody knows what will happen after 15 years if I take aspirin for 15 years. Right. I mean, you don't know many things. I mean, you do only those tests which are approved tests for toxicity mm -hmm. and uh, allergenicity and other things. Those tests should be done once proved. I think people have to be more rational mm -hmm. uh, in order to accept this technology. Fear can be created from anywhere. But it has to be scientifically proven that, uh, yes, this is not a good thing to do. But uh, we find as a student community, we find it's very strange. On one hand, government is actually funding genetically modified plant research. And that's essentially a lot of research institutes do in rice, wheat, uh, brinjal, everywhere. So why, and then other hand, the control, it should not come out. So this bifurcation at some, the conflict of what is that happened? Now many places this transformation technology and transgenic development is not always for the product development. Mm -hmm. It's a technology also for functionally validating the genes, okay. the functional biology approach. How do you test whether a gene has a specific function? How you link genes to a function? Mm -hmm. So what you do, you either overexpress it or, yeah. or you knock it out. Mm. So both things are done or make mutants out of this and then keep on testing in the plants. Like in animal systems, they will mm. probably put it in mouse or somewhere and test whether uh, what kind of phenotype you get. So a lot of work is being done in order to, to find out the functions the of the genes. Right, right. Now once you understand function of the genes, which of these are really important mm. for crop breeding crop purposes, breeding. then you can pull out those ones and test it. So a lot of research work is being funded from that point of view also. Mm. But few of these may lead, turn to, it, lead to that right. one, which is required. Not everything may be required to do that. Correct. Every, every gene we need not be pushing into rice or in maize or right, in other right. places. You know. But we should know the functions of all genes. Correctly, right. So now I'm bringing you back to JNU where you started. So, but from other uh, point of view, uh, lot of research now is done in universities and research institutes. So first in this reference question is, uh, are there any advantages of conducting research in university in comparison to 
uh, institutes and you can tell as your researcher and being the head of the institute you know there are no specific advantage or disadvantage i think uh, mm -hmm. in a university system uh, these are all individual driven mm -hmm. research you know especially uh, not every university in india is doing uh, as good uh, as you a good know. research you know mm -hmm. Uh, most of them are teaching places and uh, I hope they are all doing good teaching also. Mm -hmm. So that is very important. And there are some universities, maybe at 20, 30 or something, where uh, good research work is going on in different areas, mm -hmm. not only in biology, in chemistry, like Hyderabad University is one of the best in chemistry and many other universities which are doing it. So there are some good scientists, researchers in the university system who have established themselves. Uh, at both uh, national and international level. So, I do not see a great disadvantage there, mm -hmm. provided the person in the university system has to work little more harder okay. in order to establish himself. Facilities wise, he has to develop his own facilities. Uh, universities do not usually provide any grants okay. uh, from their own resources or even equipment or anything. There are equipment which are broader facilities right. like in JNU. We had a uh, major equipment center there, advanced instrumentation mm -hmm. facilities. So those are provided. It depends on your passion, I think. I think you know how much you want to push yourself. I had an uh, example in JNU. Uh, I don't want to name anybody, but this mm -hmm. was a husband-wife team, mm -hmm. and uh, one was working in one science school or center, another one in another one. So one of them says the university is a very bad place mm -hmm. for working, I am not getting facilities, cribbling. I am mm -hmm. not getting finances, there is no funding, mm -hmm. he is not supporting, he is not helping. So it is always uh, talking about excuses and uh, putting the blame on the somebody else. System. Why I am not successful? Mm -hmm. Because you are bad, you are not providing me anything. Mm -hmm. So that is the kind of tendency which many people have in the university systems. The same family, the husband is a Bhatnagara mm -hmm. he is a fellow of the National Academies, he is getting the major international grants, mm -hmm. he is publishing in the high impact journals, cover photos, in the same milieu, mm -hmm. same social economic milieu, he is also working. So I, I, I feel it is Personal how much you want to push yourself, how you want to work it. In institutions, in university the advantage is there in the sense that uh, you get to talk to many people if you want to. Like if you are in a place like JNU where I was uh, there uh, in different capacities, uh, you can talk to social scientists. Yes. I mean you, what you are talking uh, initially that uh, interdisciplinary work. You can talk to somebody else in physics in chemistry department, in many other places, different facilities, different way of thinking. Mm -hmm. In an institution, you get restricted, you know, it's in that restriction is becoming more and more prominent nowadays, that uh, you are restricted within your own group. Mm -hmm. You are building walls around yourself and you feel within those walls that I am the best. Okay. So that is advantage in one way because mm -hmm. you are able to work in a specific area, go much more deeper and uh, publish good work. But on the other hand, probably you miss out on many things. Right. I mean that new ideas which can flow from different fields and other things can do not flow in. You know, I do not know, many of you would know that, uh, you know, when the first university was built up, it was a teaching place. Mm -hmm. There weren't mm -hmm. research, research was not supposed to be done in the universities. It was only after Humboldt came and uh, other those people uh -huh. who started that yes, uh, university should also do research, but they were basically the teaching places. And when the first university was uh, built up in 1400, I don't know if you know where it was. If you say you are knowledgeable, mm -hmm. you are cheating yourself because you are looking at one area, one subject, one domain Very tiny, right? and uh, you are actually ignorant about uh, millions of other things around you. So we take decisions based on our ignorance rather than based on our knowledge many times because we feel that whatever we have that is the absolute knowledge. That is why we sometimes thought. That is why in January when I was uh, as Vice Chancellor I 
started what we call as the transdisciplinary research clusters. Mm -hmm. So I said uh, you will create groups across schools and centers, think about the problems in different ways, like the problem of malaria. Mm -hmm. How did uh, Sri Lanka solve the problem of malaria? They did, yes. Not because of vaccine. Yes. Because they, you have to look from social aspect, the hygienic aspects across. And this is what I told them. Our social scientists are working. There is a community health center. Talk to them also what the real issues are. Yes. And also the biology part of it, which is also very important. So all spectrum, you will have to look into it. And I was happy that uh, they were able to develop seven, eight major transdisciplinary groups and they were able to get funding. Fun, yeah. So it was not only within, actually the one which you're saying that the interaction institutes and universities. There is knowledge spread all across, how right. to bring them together. And this is where we had uh, developed uh, research programs with other universities and institutions. Mm -hmm. I signed a MOU with IIT. So we said JNU and IIT should must work together on many issues which, which can be done. So I think uh, we must work together. Uh, each one has its own advantage, disadvantage, but disadvantage can be minimized no, if well. we work together. That's how I feel between institutions and the universities. It's very, very important. We can't have, one person can't handle uh, the problems are so gigantic nowadays, whether it is biology, the big data in human health issues, yeah. uh, in agriculture, uh, that uh, you have to bring many people on board in order to solve the problem. In order to publish the paper, fine. But in order to solve the problem, everybody you will have to bring to everybody together. together. Because acceptance, as you say, transgenics, acceptance of society. We may develop certain technology. <clears throat> the impact of that technology, the economics of that technology, and benefits of that technology will be done by social scientists and economists. And that we need to keep in account. Mm. That's why in JNU we started what we call a master's program in complex studies. Mm -hmm. So this is a, because every system is a complex system, whether you take a social system or biology. Biology is the easiest because we are working on unidimension or bidimension mm -hmm. areas. But when you go to the society, it's a multidimensional. And how to analyze societies, how to develop models for the society, mm -hmm. models for the climate, models for economics, or many other things. That becomes even more complicated. And it's interaction with the human beings, you know, where the biology comes. So this was a whole a new school which is there. And they started this whole system of uh, master's program in computational computations and complex studies. So you have to see the complexity of the uh, systems. Biology is very complex. Very, very, yes. yes. So what you said is actually correct, but uh, some people might argue with you that it's actually JNU being the smaller example in general in country, research institute and universities kind of have taken two different roles. So research mm -hmm. institute primarily believe that they are responsible for research and universities just for teaching. And by research, as you suggested, maybe bridging the gap can... No, research institutes uh, take up... Uh, a specific problem you mm -hmm. know, uh, to solve these, like CSR institutes. Each one had a certain mandate. In so the, the institutions come with a mandate. Yeah. Okay, Universities don't come with research mandate. They come with a teaching mandate. Mm -hmm. And research builds up based on the individual's interest mm -hmm. and uh, what he wants to do it. But uh, institutions have a mandate that you must work in this disease, mm -hmm. you must work in this one, or National Institute of Immunology, you work in this, because their names are like that. Okay. With time it changes. With time. But what has happened over a period of time, like even like CSR institutes never used to have a PhD program. And then they have. Now they have a PhD program, because the scientists were supposed to work <laughs> themselves. But then the manpower development, the facilities to be provided to students that came up. Uh, they do little bit of teaching, but not uh, otherwise. I, I have no problem with uh, each institution's university, mm. how they develop, so long as uh, they are able to bring out the best uh, in them. The best students, best products, and uh, good skill development, international level. So since science. we have changed the definition of research institute and university, what originally it was meant to be, so now is it not possible that you can just integrate 
and encourage universities to do more research and research institute to take up more teaching? I would put the other way around. Research uh -huh. institutes, let them continue. Uh, more teaching means then they will have to go to undergraduate or postgraduate teaching, mm -hmm. which may not be feasible uh, at this stage. Uh, but I think uh, universities should, at least some of those universities, must take up research in a mm -hmm. big way. Because that's where the undergraduate student comes. You know, undergraduate, postgraduate students, right you can train that yes. uh, right from day one. Mm -hmm. and they can be uh, trained in uh, research areas. Not that everybody who comes from the university has to become a scientist or a researcher. Uh, they can adopt a different uh, professions for themselves. Mm -hmm. But at least whatever profession they adopt, right. wherever they go, you they must give the best out of them. So Absolutely. that is where I think a good training ground can be kept there. And institutions get those products, mm -hmm. make use of those, I mean, put them into their milieu and get the best science out of it. So I think uh, there is a complementarity uh, in these two places. Right. And uh, both things can go on in both places. But I, I don't think institutions in, should get into undergraduate or postgraduate teaching at this stage. So in, uh, since you've seen research institute and universities very closely, so in your and interacted with very many students and have been a teacher, so in your opinion, would you call uh, India, uh, Indian students innovative? Or are we as Indians very innovative? If not, how can we become more innovative? Because we have a lot of problems to tackle in society, being a developing nation. I think we always underestimate ourselves. As I was telling you, students uh, told me what I should do. They are innovative. They are innovative. They can tell you uh, many things. I think we, uh, we take innovation out of them. We take curiosity out of them mm -hmm. and uh, it's become more machine orientation kind of thing. So because the kind of the teaching which we have, we have to complete the syllabus, mm -hmm. which is good, you know, maybe something at the undergraduate level, they should uh, learn basic things. So it's basically how much information is available in an area, you should also we know should that know information. That. So based on that information, then when you go to the postgraduate level, that is where the curiosity demand has to be come up. Like in the University of Maryland, once I was there, you know, I was in Maryland for some time. You know, kind of a question paper they give, questions, you know. So the student was given a project proposal and he was asked that you have to evaluate this project and tell whether this project should be funded or not funded. So you have to read all the background, everything and tell funded. The second a writer on this was that the person mm -hmm. whose paper you are, whose project you are, uh, you know, reviewing, mm -hmm. is a Nobel laureate, and he can be sitting on your appointment in the next university. Okay. So now we evaluate. No, it's 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 something which uh, tells you that how objective you have to be. Right. And they have written the project, the professor has written a project where there is fallacies. But he has put a rider also there. Your so job depends on him. Your job depends on him. <laughs> and he's a he's Nobel laureate. So, he's so very what intelligent. normally what we happen here, if I see that yeah, job is <laughs> very good project. <laughs> so that is the kind of training which you can go through, uh, you know. So I think uh, at that level, you know, more like level. a real training. Yeah, so but that's why I think interaction with the students and giving them in most of the universities experimentation is minimal, even in biology mm -hmm. and other places. You don't do many experiments. Some experiments they conduct, but uh, in along with the teaching, there is a two credit course on experiments. But the kind of experiments we do. Uh, very, minimal. very, very minimal. Yeah. You don't let them design an experiment and do themselves, you know. So there also the problems comes up. So innovation will come. And the same student who passes his undergraduate from here goes to US and he becomes an innovator. Yes. And we tell him here he is not an innovator because actually we have not provided. You need a good milieu also. Yeah. He is good, but if he has a great idea, uh, where will he test it? How will he do it? Unless he finds that whole. Uh, 
So I think innovation, you can pick up people, not everybody. I don't think 100% uh, people would be innovators, mm -hmm. but you pick up at uh, undergraduate, postgraduate level. There used to be search, science talent search or something, something like this. Pick up 50 people uh, who was, uh, you know, neck for the uh, innovation th thinking and uh, groom them up. And also Sometimes. give liberty to change their mind if they you want know, they to. They can change. They want to change one subject to other subject. Yeah. The first thing which we do if you go into biology, don't learn mathematics. Yes, precisely. Okay, this is what I did in JNU as Vice Chancellor. We created what we call the mathematics empowerment cell in the university level. And I said everybody should know mathematics. In fact, we are told that you can't take maths because if I take biology, biology, physics, chemistry. And today without maths, you can't do much. You can't do in any field, whether it's social sciences, any things, because people even don't know how to correlate and all those things. So I think uh, that whole uh, subject selections uh, yeah, need to be re-looked at. Mm -hmm. So you pointed out that in students particularly don't get much exposure because of limitation of resources and not able to do ex right experiments. So what is that we can do? I mean, it's a scientific community that we can attract more funding from government and then convince them this is something important for innovation at uh, every level essentially, at not just PhD level. I, I think each university, as our President of India also has been saying, that we should have innovation clubs, huh. innovation centers, you know, which should have all the facilities given there. So, we, like MHRD, UGC, and others, uh, if they are approached uh, properly, that this is what we want to do, probably government can give certain funding in this direction. Funding becomes a major constraint mm -hmm. in many of these. If somebody has an idea, he wants to prove. But what we are doing is, uh, we are tossing with small ideas, mm -hmm. which can be done. So first you look at in the laboratory or these places, what equipment exists. And according to the equipment, you, you design question. your experiment. Right, right. If I think big, what can I do? I can have no way to uh, really uh, work on this. So this is where expansion, mm -hmm. more funding. Uh, if he has a good idea and he needs some things, not very big equipment, but at least the major equipment, the university or the institution should be able to provide that if they find that the uh, idea is a good one, a brilliant idea, which may mature into something good. So that's why selection of talent, innovators, and incubating that, those ones, for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. Give them, let them do PhD, postdoc, whatever Where it is. Uh, don't uh, leave them halfway that uh, after they have tossed an idea, they have tested it, and then they start searching for uh, a PhD place, then a only Miller postdoc. So they, they are searching all the time. They don't have a stability to sit with that idea and nurture that idea. But is there somewhere we are not able to communicate effectively with the government that we are not able we to... Are communicating in different ways, different uh -huh. places they are doing it, but... Uh, I mean, government themselves say that this is the funding which you have done, given to the university, you decide what to do. But each university, when you ask, I think uh, there is uh, limited funds. Either government has limited funds, uh, which they can't put it in these areas. Mm -hmm. uh, there are also many rules, regulations, uh, archaic rules, uh, which one has to deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, it has to be uh, open atmosphere. Universities, to me, I told many times, it has to be very open, open thinking no restrictions of any kind. Mm -hmm. Think good. Big. Mm. Perform. Perform, right. That's more important. Once you are given the facilities, you should be able to perform also. Not that you just take a facility for the sake of facilities. Many universities in places I have visited, uh, the equipment were given from DST or others. Users in me. You take an equipment, but uh, hardly a usage for those ones. There are, we have to look within ourselves. I don't always blame the government or something like this. I think we must uh, look within whether whatever we have been given, are we making the best use of those facilities? Accountability. And give, accountability and giving the best out of that. Right. The purpose for which that. Even with whatever little we have, probably we can do well. And Indian science, as far as the amount of money which is given to Indian science, 
our productivity is not bad. Okay. What facilities are given, what money is given, I think students and researchers are doing a good job from that perspective. So actually you leading me to last two questions. So in your opinion, how good we have done in Indian science in comparison to international standards? That's the um, first two. If you, uh, and look where at, do you see uh, us going from if here? If you look at uh, Harvard and uh, Boston and uh, Princeton, uh, we are far below. Far behind. Below right. in that. But in many other Asian countries, if you look at our BRICS countries and others, I think many of the institutions have performed uh, reasonably very good. Many of the scientists individu individually, many of them are We're done very, well. very, very, very well. Mm -hmm. uh, some institutions have done very well. But number of institutions and the universities in this country is very limited at this stage. 700 something. Hmm? 700. Which, what? Number of universities and universities. No, oh, our total universities, uh, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. would be central universities are 40. Mm -hmm and then state universities Somewhere. and all that. Now most of the state universities, some of them are very good, but others are not mm -hmm. giving any research output from that point of view. Uh, central universities, uh, 20 are new ones, it's only 18, 20 which are old ones which have established and are performing uh, very well. So if you compare from that angle, I think uh, it's not been bad, but yes, many will say the universities are not ranking in 200 or 100 uh, top uh, universities in the world. For that, there are many other reasons uh, which one can think about. But we have to improve ourselves, no doubt about it. Uh, we have to work hard, improve, and come up to that uh, higher level. India is a big country. Uh, we need more institutions and more universities. If you say there are 1.2 billion population, compared to that, the number of institutions yes, which we have is very low. Total good institutions in this country would be how much? 30, 40 or something, you need to take. New York City alone has 150 institutions. They do actually. Maybe in that, in New York and surrounding areas. Yeah. The top institutions, you know. The amount of funding there and number of institutions is so big. Here we can count, there you can't even count. You know. So I think comparisons have to be on equal. In level, same scale. So it's in same scale. Right. But uh, as I was telling you, based on what we have got, mm -hmm. I think the performance is not bad, but we need definitely improvement on every every scale. And now to the second question, since you've been involved in teaching too, so what? Uh, so for a student, how important are the personal virtues such as integrity, commitment, hard work for success for students? So as a reinforcement from you. Integrity from teacher on the part student, of teacher. Students. For oh, student, yes, of course. <laughs> I mean, yeah, how much the they should take it seriously for research particularly that matters in their work, not personally speaking? You no, know, what happens, uh, I, I used to get complaints uh, in JNU from faculty, uh, I don't have a good student. If you ask them why you are not producing, he said, I don't have a good student. Now, why your performance is dependent upon your student? That's one thing, you know, you perform, you know, that's what it is. The second thing is, what is the definition of a good and a bad student, you know? I, I think uh, somewhere many of the researchers, faculty, uh, to take it is you want the best student. Best student is one who works independently without troubling you and uh, does his job very well and something like this. I was telling our social milieu in the university has changed in you know, the institutions. You may have a student who has come from a different background. I used to see it in JNU. You know, sometimes if you won't believe the uh, places from where the students come and they have that passion to do it, mm. they may not be able to perform in the first year or first you know, one and a half years because they are getting adjusted to many okay. things in that one. So if you make up your mind the student is not good, I don't agree to that. There is Investment one, needed, time. You have to give a lot of time, you have mm. to work with them and bring them up. That is one. But basically a student will have to there is no uh, bypass for hard work and uh, commitment. Commitment for what you have started your work and uh, hard work, you will have to do it. Experiment will have to be done. You can't sit idle and the experiment gets done by itself. So if the experiment needs 24 hours, you will have to spend 24 hours. When I was in USDA, uh, I used to spend nights there. 
Mm -hmm. So one day the director was walking there, there and he found the light there. You know. So he came, what are you doing? I said, we have an experiment. He said, but experiment must not be running all day, you know, uh, the director of that lab. I said, uh, not whole night, but in between I have to change something, you know, you run at different time points. He said, but you should take rest. I said, uh, on this bench, we take rest. <laughs> you know, he was so good, uh, he went to his office the next day, he got one room opened up, put some sofas and benches. And he said, when you are working in the night, I think you can rest. Lie there. down. Lie down here. Yeah. So that is, you know, th there is nothing like day and night for his switch. Mm -hmm. Experiment has to be done, it has to be done. That, uh, so that hard work, commitment, passion, and you must like your project. It should not be imposed on you. If you like the project, take it. Otherwise, you will feel it's a burden. Burden, right. And of course, experiments will not succeed every time. My professor in Germany, Professor Hermann, one of the scientists went to him, you know, he joined the laboratory and uh, he was asked to do certain experiments. He went to his lab that uh, my experiments have succeeded. I was getting good results. He said, you are the most unfortunate person. He said, why? He said, you never failed, you know, this is not, you will never learn. If somebody whose experiment works the first time, he hasn't learned anything. It was a different way. Of course, his experiment worked, it worked. <laughs> but he said, only when your experiments will fail, you will learn. Because next time, when you're a researcher and a professor, and your student's experiment doesn't work, you will be able to tell why it didn't work. If it worked for you, you will never be able to solve his problem. You know, the whole outlook uh, is very different. Here we get frustrated very easily. And what's your suggestion when students, maybe sometimes we do get stuck up on a problem for a significant amount of time. And then you change the problem, of course, you know, at that stage when your time is limited, because as a PhD student, your time is limited. As a researcher, my time is, is unlimited. I can try many things, but for a student, if it doesn't work for some time, I think then the supervisor must look into it, that you change your problem. I changed my problem in my PhD. Oh, you, okay. Yeah, I, I was working on, that was telling RNA isolations and other things which I was doing. There was no scintillation counter, there was nothing in the facilities. I was running around. And there was some trouble, that's what I had to leave also in between. And when I came back, the professor said that I can't provide you these facilities, you know, although you have interest in this. So let's change your problem to something else which will work. So you changed it and you worked, got your degree. Getting degree is not the end of your research career. And that's the beginning of your career. And then you move on. Uh, at some time you will get opportunity to do what you want to do uh, yourself. Because every uh, problem which is in your mind cannot be done just during the period of PhD. It is a long career. It goes up to end of your life actually, I think, you know, it never ends. Thinking never ends, working never ends. Enjoy it. I think you know, science should be enjoyed. But I know it's difficult, you know, when, when uh, your fellowship is not with you, you know, after three years fellowship is not coming, CSIR is not releasing, UGC is not releasing money, you know, that frustration comes up. But and then your overcome. friends doing better than you. <laughs> that, that is no comparison. That's no comparison. I think you should never compare that one, friends. You know, it's possible one of your friend may publish a good paper during his PhD. And no guarantee he will be a successful scientist later on. The other one may do better. I mean, these things, uh, comparisons should never be. Each one is an individual. Uh, you have your own uh, talents. You have your own passions. You should... Uh, Look at yourself. You learn from everybody, but don't get dejected because somebody else is doing better. Uh, it's, you feel happy about it. At least somebody is doing better. I will also do. And time will come when you will also perform yourself. I hope you liked our interaction session with Dr. Sapori and learned the lesson that hard work and passion are two very important ingredients of being successful at any job. Please visit our website or like us and subscribe us on YouTube. Thank you.